Hi, and welcome to the Sunday Lunch Project Manager podcast for Sunday, the 4th of September. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Andy Kaufman, the People and Projects Guy. So this week we are again uh, supported by Tamplo. Um, Tamplo is a uh, online tool that uh, turns meetings into actions uh, and uh, has a number of different features. Uh, the bit I'm going to talk about today is around the project and task management and the follow-up. Uh, essentially, you have a, a clear dashboard that shows you an overview of scheduled tasks, alert ta- for late tasks, an overview of team's progress. It saves you jumping into your Outlook and being di- diverted by that mor- morass of email that we get. Um, you can create your own daily plan in there, or you can, as a project manager, you may be assigning tasks to people. And those people can look at those, uh, have their own daily plans, adding in their own specific items they've got to do, as well as the things allocated to them. Uh, the, for the project management point of view, you get a dedicated dashboard with a list of tasks, knowing what people are working on on each project. And there's a load of collaboration capability in there. With a the goal of getting no task left undone, uh, more, efficient and mo- uh, more efficiency and motivation, and clear action plans. So if you want to see what this is all about, jump along to tinyurl.com com slash Nigel Creasa Templo. That's all one word, Nigel Creasa Templo. Have fun. So, what the heck's been going on for the last couple of weeks? Well, I have been on holiday for a week, which has been fantastic. Um, a week in Greece in the sun, first time I've done that in a long, long time, uh, and me and my t- wife and two daughters uh, staying in a lovely hotel, had a pool close, and uh, we spent a lot of time just playing in the pool, chilling out, and hopefully you guys have had a chance to do something like that over the summer. Came back to the office on Friday, just gone, and actually, it's the first time in a long time when I'm coming back from leave, which I wasn't feeling too... Uh, down, if you know the feeling, I was kind of ready, I was rejuvenated, I was ready, Um, I saw a post from John Amici on uh, LinkedIn the other day, and he talked about the the need for for refilling your well, your energy well, and your emotional well, and your creative well, I think is is there as well, and and we all have different ways to do it, but sometimes we don't practice that self-care. And in doing that, I found that as fantastic. Uh, also, uh, one of my, my previous guests, Tammy uh, Watchhorn, who I mentioned on previous shows, she was launching her new book. Um, uh, congratulations to Tammy on how well that went. Uh, she got there with a bestseller tag, and, and I think she's uh, had a, a bit of a whirlwind the last few weeks as it's been released, um, but it's going really well. And I started reading it on the on my holiday as well and found it really interesting I think I had to share something on when I got to like page four or something like that it was really insightful so um, I urge you uh, pop along to my website nigelcreaser.com have a look on uh, the shop page and uh, you can grab a copy of her book there uh, highly recommend it and I've only a couple of chapters in so far and I've already found it really useful so um, I, I was really intrigued to see what happens when I get to the end um so that's the main things that have been going on in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I suppose the, the other thing to talk about is a podcast. Lots and lots of people um, available at the moment for interviews. So uh, I've got a lot of those scheduled and a lot of them in the hopper. Um, this one with Andy uh, is the first one where we, I will be moving to weekly so next week you will have a part two. So they'll be coming to conf- uh, the confast uh, over the coming weeks, uh, rather than you having to wait a couple of weeks for the second part. So hopefully that will be useful. Uh, what else is going on? The only other thing I suppose, and I don't know, tell you guys anyways. I um, uh, on the podcast, some of you may have seen from many years ago. I did 2017. I started. Uh, shouting into the internet as I describe it um, and a lot of those uh, initial ones were kind of just being a bit silly and, and a bit experimental 
uh, and I'm not sure if when people have found the podcast or been introduced to them whether they hit those first few and then found actually what's the point of this so what I've actually done is paired those back and added in the uh, uh, changed it to be some of the newer uh, the, the interview type podcasts as being the first ones they see so maybe that will help uh, as well with listeners and, and keeping people uh, listening um, uh, final thing was uh, a couple of things that I've seen recently um, uh, Jonathan uh, the major projects people um, Jonathan Norman a former guest on the show set up a, a, um, a thing called Opina uh, delivery experts where they pose a question or someone poses a question to a number of people and I'm very lucky to be part of that uh, in the project management arena uh, for everyone to give a view on it um, and there are some fantastic uh, uh, wonder wall as they call it of all these different videos um, they've just relaunched it it started again um, a couple of days ago uh, so uh, have a look on and search for delivery experts on LinkedIn and you'll find some information on that I'm sure that you will find uh, the comments the thoughts uh, from the contributors to be both insightful and challenging and informative so uh highly recommend that uh the other thing just as a bit of a shout out for um, pmi have got their annual awards uh coming up and it's now due for um uh, the pmi uk story um is uh ready for and taking um nominations so pop along to pmi dot org.uk I think the the address is and you'll find all the details there um, about how you can nominate either a project or a um, uh, an individual uh, uh, in the project management arena um, who's worthy of um, recognition I was lucky to be a judge last year um, and found the, the cases that came through across what I was looking at um, which was people knew in the in their careers and, and around the public sector side were uh, incredible um so uh, keep an eye out for that it's really useful anyway i'm going to shut up now and i'm going to let you get on and listen to andy and um come back later cheers now. enjoy today i'm absolutely delighted to welcome andy kaufman to the show um andy is um uh, an international speaker and author an executive coach and president of the Institute of Leadership, Excellence and Development, Inc. Andy works with organizations around the world, helping them improve their ability to deliver projects and lead teams. His keynotes, workshops and executive coaching services have reached tens of thousands of people from hundreds of companies around the years, uh, helping them deliver projects, become more confident leaders, take focused action and deliver results. He brings a rich background of over 25 years of experience in executive management, technology, team leadership, project management, consulting, and coaching. Um, he is also, and some of you will have known him from this, he's the host of the People and Projects podcast, um, which provides interviews and insights to help listeners lead people and deliver projects. Uh, it focuses on the intersection of people and projects, where the work gets done in a real world. So Andy, welcome to the show. Oh man, Nigel, I've been looking forward to this. We've been working to get a date together and I'm so glad yeah. this has worked out. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 always the same though, isn't it? It's, uh, juggling diaries is 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 the life of of a lot of people, isn't it? And yeah, and it yeah, the the added the added side of it has been on other sides of the pond. Um right. It doesn't help either, does it? Cuz it just has that complexity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I I just appreciate your flexibility and like I said, I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate getting on. So let's get let's get straight into it. People will tell um, uh, from your accent that you are um, from the US. Um, uh, let's let's start right at the beginning. Where were you born, Andy? Where were you born? Well, for anybody that knows the states, you know, there's the people on the East Coast and the West Coast, but I grew up right in the middle in the Midwest, which is known for uh, cornfields and flatland and uh, tornadoes <laughs> and so I, I grew up in a in a small town in in kind of a, a cornfield so right. yeah, yeah yeah so I, I grew up just in a small town in which I 
I'm very happy to have been growing up there, but moved to Chicago after college. And so quite different from the cornfields. And so I'm the guy, even to this day, looking at the skyscrapers, you know, like really enjoy the, the city. Yeah. So I'm guessing if, if I was uh, thinking now, you immediately you say about the Midwest and, and cornfields, I start thinking of Kevin Costner and Field of Dreams or, right, or, right, exactly. or thinking about um, uh, James T. Kirk in the Star Trek thing when he's driving through Iowa in, uh, right. with, uh, with Beastie Boys playing. I don't know if that, it's that same sort of... That yeah, same, that, you get the feel. You, you yeah. totally have got the vibe of what I yeah. grew up like. Yeah. The yeah, big, cool. massive skies and big, long, straight roads. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there's many, many advantages to it. You know, like uh, I, th I think after being in a big city now for a long time, when I go back, I just really appreciate what I was able to experience growing up. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it, it, sometimes as 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 you say, as you grow up, I, I, I catch myself sometimes I live in a, a rural area and, and the town I live in near me is a market town, which I grew up in. And I don't, I'm not there as often as I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll drive into there from slightly different directions sometimes. And I would be paying different attention. And suddenly I'll, I'll, there's this one road I remember it keeps catching me that I never noticed growing up. But as I drive in there now, every so often I see that there, we've got a church on the top of the hill, a really nice building just below it, another nice building just there. And I just kind of go, wow, if you're driving into here, never seeing it before, yeah, right. and they've got one of the old, you know, the black and white, crooked buildings in the town center you just go into that town and you think oh this is a lovely little town and to me it's just you 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 don't see it do you and, yeah, and yeah, you don't see uh, it absolutely yeah you don't see the beauty of where you are because it you're i suppose it's that's the way our brains function isn't it is to go right that's not changed that's not changed that's not changed right there's no there's no threat <laughs> which means yeah. you don't get that benefit either of how lovely it is every once i'll run into somebody that says uh how could someone live wherever right then I think something my wife and I feel like we've learned more and more as we've gotten older is it's not the where, it's the who. Like yeah. you, can, you can live in the most beautiful place on the face of the earth, but if you don't enjoy the people around you, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. Or if you don't have friends or connections, or you can live in a cornfield <laughs> yeah. and be surrounded by people you love, right? It's the, yeah, it's yeah. the who. Yeah, it's, 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 it is people. And obviously with your podcast and your focus is always about is the people and we're, we're obviously going to talk about that a little bit uh, and okay. and people is the and it a number of times in 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 conversations i've had recently um and the things i see on linkedin as well the conversations going on there it's kind of which process is going to get the project delivered and none of the process is going to get the project delivered right. <laughs> uh, only so true, the people. yeah it's, it's just so it's it's crazy how that kind of thing that forgetting that, that squishy things deliver stuff, not, mm. not non-squishy things. That's so true. you say you live in Chicago now. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So where live in the, like the Northwest suburbs of it. So if I was to hop on a train, it'd take me maybe 40 minutes into the city. If I was to drive it, depending on the time of day, it could be two hours, <laughs> but wow. it's a, uh, yeah, but it's, it's close enough that we really get to enjoy the city. And, and you know, I, I like Chicago's reputation has maybe been tainted in recent years with violence, but you know, just about any big city, there's you know, there's the upside and the downside. But Chicago, yeah. it's it's a beautiful city. Like it, you know, Lake Michigan is. If you stand next to it, you think you're next to an ocean. You know, yeah. Like that. And so it's a, it really is a lovely city. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's places I've seen on the TV and kind of places you think well yeah that looks quite interesting to go to um so you you mentioned yeah your wife there what what about family what, what were you 100 yeah, kids have, uh, five kids <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah we actually have five kids yeah we have uh, yeah. we have five kids have uh, three of which are uh our bio kids and then when our three oldest were in their teenage years we just felt like we're not quite done yet and so we adopted two additionals we went from uh from teenagers to diapers and that wow. was a project we'd forgotten what that <laughs> stakeholder management was like so that it was a fun it was a fun like a chance to do it over again and uh, wow. the three oldest are out of the house married actually one of them he's in the film industry and he teaches some of my project management classes because film is what? projects oh, yeah. so he yeah. grew up thinking of it that way and, and most importantly our first grandchild was born last week so now i'm a girl oh wow uh, ah right so grandpa kaufman we're talking to yeah, you. yeah is, absolutely yeah. and how's that is that so so you're back with the diapers again yeah although they they live uh 
over in the Middle East. So, right. <laughs> so okay. It's a little, a little further away, but uh, hopefully in August we'll be able to go see him. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Brilliant! Yeah. Brilliant! So, yeah. that's that's a, quite a, and I'm, like I my the gap between my two kids is five years, yeah. and the, the shock to our system when we had the second was massive. Teenage, if I did it now uh, with my teenager going to there, I yeah, I my my head would explode. So that's off to you. Well, you know, I uh, part of the secret in life is marrying above yourself, and so I did that. <laughs> my wife, <laughs> my wife's incredible, but but actually, you no, know, interestingly, Nigel, the older kids kind of helped take care of the younger kids as well. Yeah, really, I suppose that. Yeah. It, it, there really was something about the the developing skills to help them be parents, you know, and so yeah. it's all worked out. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing, the thing I've always found with ours with the, the, the five-year gap. Touch wood, I'll touch everything here. Um, uh, we don't tend to get matches 15 and 10 we've got, and they, they don't, we don't have massive arguments and that. And and I yeah. know other friends who've got kids who are a bit closer, and I think there's a the closer they mm-hmm. are, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of com- competition. Yeah. Whereas, as you say, you've got that as, you, as they're a bit older, they are more protective of the... A very young sibling it's like the, the junior yeah. junior scenario isn't it when you've got I think so. it just it just makes them more protective and then it less so. less argument and then and they'll put up with more the little yeah, one can yeah. get away with more as well i suppose yeah yeah that's actually a beautiful way of saying it i think that's a good observation yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's interesting so when you grew up uh in the midwest uh, where, whereabouts in the midwest was it then it was uh, uh, Illinois is one of the states in the middle. So Chicago is part of the state of Illinois and right. in the, almost right in the middle of Illinois. So right. it's, a town, it's a little town called uh, Morton, which is outside of a town called Peoria. And right. so, uh, so we thought Peoria was the big city, right? But it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know that feeling. I know that feeling. Uh, maybe on a different scale, because obviously yeah. in the UK where everything's drink, but it's kind of like, yeah, it, there's places that when I was a kid, I'd look as being the that was a big trip to go 30 miles you know what i mean that was to the to the, the, the near chester the city up in up near liverpool and you know and and going anywhere thinking of that there london was mm. just like astounding sort of thing and i i find it quite shocking that just it's all con- it's all perspective isn't it hey, sir, that you're yeah. saying yeah you're in you're in chicago and you've got a 40 minute train drive and a two hour a two hour drive uh-huh. but i'm uh-huh. thinking two hour drive for me that's the, the other side of the country. Um, <laughs> it's a forty-minute train drive. Uh, you know, it, it, it kind of it, that's com- I, I I I see it as completely different. Is it really interesting on the scale of the of the of well, you guys over in the US and us over here? But I, I've got a son who his dream would be to go see a Chelsea game. Yeah, the home stadium. I mean, that that would be his dream. So, as much as we have plenty of things in the U.S., I mean, yeah. uh, you 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 live in a beautiful and a historical and uh, you know an epic in many ways part of the world. Yeah, and I, but again, I think it's that same thing of where you come from, and where you go, isn't it? It's just, yeah, right. You look <laughs> you look across to you guys over there, and the 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 you, we all romanticize somewhere where we're not, don't we? Yeah. Um, and actually, we, we, sometimes with projects, we do the same, I find. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, sure. you look I at someone else's company, right? If yeah. I worked at that company, if I had yeah. that boss, you yeah. know, oh, how things would be so much yeah. better. Yeah. If I had that project, right. if I had that team, it, right, sometimes you'll get, maybe, maybe that's a bit extreme on the team thing, but you know what I mean? It's kind of, you, yeah. you, you do, the, I think that the saying, the grass is always greener kind of thing. It does, we all try not to be like that, but I think it, yeah. it does, we, it naturally plays out, doesn't it? Oh, you know, so, there's, a, there's, a, there's a former Secretary of Defense of the U.S. who he said something along the line. If this is not a direct one, it's really close. He goes, you don't go to war with the army you wish you had. You go to war with the army that you have. And, you know, that's kind of a version of the grass is greener. Like it'd be, yeah. it might be nice if, but that's helped me in so many situations of, I would yeah. love to have a couple of different subject matter experts, or I'd love to have different stakeholders, but. This is this is the army I've got, you know. Yeah, and yeah. So uh, we're, that's yeah, the, how we that's how we lead projects. Yeah, that's that's a really good good way of putting it. It's kind of um, yeah, I like that because it gives you that. Um, sorry. Yeah, hey, no problem. I'm writing this down, and you'll find this. I do this, and I don't cut it out now. I've started writing down stuff that I think I think is 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 of noteworthy, so that when I do my little edits. I can pull stuff out. And I'm quite happy yeah. to talk about that here. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of these are the bits that are kind have, of make me think, oh, 
there. And I'm trying to get better at that rather than just trying to work it out. So Brilliant. for those people out there listening to this, that's why I'm doing stopped and paused for a moment there. Yeah. 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 It's uh, and if you're if you're watching, you'll have seen that I looked like I was looking down at the floor, but that's uh, because I was writing. And I can't do two things at once. That's my my stuff when I bang on about productivity, do one thing at once really well. Um so so when you were there in uh, in Morton growing up, um what did you want to be? Was it a project manager? Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I've yet to meet anybody who at age eight said, mommy, someday I want to be a project manager. Like, you know, I just, <laughs> you know, we don't usually say that sort of thing. So I knew at a pretty early age, I loved computers. I had an uncle that had the model is called the TRS-80. And I don't know, maybe it's called different things in different countries, but it was no, one that of the rings early a bell. Person- yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I seem to call it Radio Shack was the company or something like that. Mm-hmm. But he had it in his closet. He wasn't using it anymore. And he goes, would you like this? You know, Nigel, you would have thought I found like the fountain of youth or something. Like I, I could not walk away from this <laughs> thing. And, and so I kind of fell in love with programming. And then I had a teacher in high school that truthfully, I wouldn't say he was a great teacher for computers, but he didn't get in the way. And I think there's a lesson there sometimes. You yeah. don't have to be a great project manager, but don't get in the way. You know? yeah. Yeah. And he didn't get in the way. So if I'd say, hey, you know, can I try that? He'd be like, sure. You know, and uh, uh, there was somebody that worked at the school that did some computer stuff. And she's like, I said, can I help? She goes, sure. And so I had the blessing of people that just allowed me to do some experimenting yeah. and just you know, I had summer jobs then that led to software development. So, so the, the early on, like I, it wasn't uh, uh, be a policeman or a pilot or a fireman or whatever. It's like, I wanted to be a software developer. So that was what yeah. I wanted early on. Yeah. Well, I suppose sort of, um, I don't want to, unless you want to give away your age, sort of eighties um, uh, was when uh, that was the, the, the pickup of it was, yeah it became something cool, didn't it? You had, yeah. you'd watch on the TV, you, you, you'd have films, you'd have IT people in the films, wouldn't you? You have things like Flight of the Navigator, you have um, yeah. war games, all the stuff covered in um, uh, the film Ready Player One. I don't know if you've seen that, a lot of the, the stuff there. That was that was the, that was was the when it was really starting to ramp up. And for anyone who's into computers, that that those sort of things were kind of making you think, well, yeah, can I hack into the NATO computer systems or whatever as yeah. a five-year-old with your vic 20 or whatever whatever and that um it, yeah it felt, it felt like the uh whatever country someone's in whatever their pioneering days was that's what it yeah. felt like to me you know yeah. it was like this new thing and yeah. all this potential and uh it, it wasn't it wasn't even that it was cool i just loved it nigel i mean i just i i could go without food or drink you know for it felt like 12 hours just because I'm playing around, it was yeah. probably something completely meaningless, but it still was just this fun challenge of how to learn how to do it. Yeah, it's interesting because that, that, it, it's that draw to problem solving, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I know that, um, and, and I, I still do it now in, in learning how to do all this stuff, yeah. learning yeah. how to publish these my books and stuff, learning how right. to do... Um, some of the sort of artworky type stuff with um, yes. social media and that I always find you can sit there sometimes and look at some of me stuck there for ages and you just go, hang on. Oh, I spent ages doing it. And I think again, that, that was something that you had with the computers in those early days is right. You know, you can get it to do something. You didn't have yeah. YouTube and you kind of had some instructions from somewhere. And I don't know where you kind of got them those days thinking about right, that, right. unless you've got a book or something and yeah. kind of played around, um, Get even the the thing of you get it to say hello, um, right? Hello on the screen, and and then you work out to put the semicolon on the end of the basic, and then it fills the whole screen, and then you get work out how to make it change colors as well. And it's all those little things that the first things you learn, isn't it? You're speaking my language, Nigel. That that was that was early on because, like you said, we didn't have the YouTube or we didn't have uh, all these other things to be able to help, and so it's just the experimentation. I think to this day, and this is a good side but a bad side of me as well. I love debugging. So yeah. like you said, it's a problem solving thing. But the the downside of that is the project manager who's the firefighter and always loves just debugging is yeah. maybe not forward thinking enough. And so yeah. I, I, I struggle with that and also 
sometimes the perfectionism of like, gotta get it better. You know, like, like your yeah. social media stuff. I mean, you're, you're doing a really good job, Nigel. Uh, I, I love that. watching you. I think you do a really good job of helping get the word out and you, you invest heavily in our community, which I really appreciate a lot. I don't know if you struggle with this, but it's when is good, good enough, right? Well, like when, when is it just good enough? And this last weekend, I spent some time with a team member of mine and he, he'd come across an acronym GETMO, G-E-T-M-O, good enough to move on. Yeah. GETMO, G-E-T-M-O. And I, th- for me, I'm, I'm going to hold on to that one because, yeah, all right, this is good enough to move on. You know, it, this is good enough. GETMO. Yeah, yeah I like that. And, and do you know what? I, I think kind of go back to the military an- analogy, and I don't know if yeah. this is true, but I remember the, the original Jeeps. Um, I can't remember what Jeep stood yeah. for something, and yeah. it was just enough. Equip, something like just enough equipment to perform or something like that or, or, or something like that and, and whether that's true or not or whether it's just you know a myth thing but that's kind of how it was done that was why it was called one of those because they were in bits weren't they when they were shipped out to places and they got assembled so it was just enough just, just things yeah. and yeah. and i think that and and the, the other one in that analogy in that is um i heard was is valentino rossi motorcycle racer mm. probably the best greatest of all time motorcycle racer in, in MotoGP. gp his his technique was to finish the race in the front as slow as he could <laughs> because going any faster puts him at risk going any fast could mean he doesn't finish the race and it's mm-hmm. kind of you you win it as slow as you can win it and that's a similar sort of thing isn't it and it i, I think the, the perfectionist in us yeah. uh, and i can be like this sometimes and, and actually i struggle with it less mm-hmm. than some people because I am quite happy to make a mistake. I am happy to throw something out there and then go back and go, oops, I've got to fix that. Yeah. Happy to do it. Did it do its job? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That That's the thing. And and I think I'm, I'm, I'm better at doing that than some people, but sometimes yeah. not, depending on what mood I'm in really and what I'm doing it on. And I think yeah. it does a little pride there. And I think I love the, I don't, I'm sure you've been exposed to it, the disc model. Yeah. Um, the, the high C sort of tendency that we have sometimes that can stifle us. And I've talked about it on the show before where I've got people who I've known have been high C's. I'm more in the high I area. And it's really good to have that combination because they stop me being an idiot. And I, <laughs> and I drag them on a little bit. It's kind of really, really useful balance. I can, I can be a little bit risk taking a little bit too much. And, and they're a little bit uh, more risk averse. And it, again, it's, it's, it's all these different mixes. So just, just, Thinking about about um, you growing up and thinking about, um, I think we were talking there about how we're kind of learning and, and how we might, when you were doing the old computers and all that school, yeah. did you continue on? What did you do after after school and high school? And did you go on to college? And yeah, you know, I was a uh, a reasonably good basketball player. Not not able to play at the highest levels in college, but good enough to play at, we would call division two in the States, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not like that's the a, top ones, but that's it, a good but, level though. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it was a great way to go to school because, you know, instantly you've got a community and things like that. But right before I w- uh, went off for school, uh, there was, uh, I wouldn't say he's a formal mentor, but he'd been in business for a while. And I told him that I was interested in computers. And I'll tell you, Nigel, something he, it was really important. He said, he goes, don't just study computers. He goes, too many people come out and they're like super techie, but they don't understand yeah. business. And so see if you can find some way to get some business classes in there. And the school that I went to had, at the time, they called it business data processing. But really what it was, it was like a business degree with a computer science degree, kind of married. Mash together. Oh, and, I do. Uh, it, oh, it was, it was, as it turns out, a bigger gift than what I realized. Yeah. yeah. So I did study that and then had summer jobs doing the software development. I, I'm sure I learned far more in the summer jobs than I actually did in school. <laughs> I'm sure, for sure. So obviously then you did all that, you were doing your summer jobs, you assume you passed your exams, et cetera. What did you, what did you move on to then? What did you start doing? I'm guessing you went into that IT yeah. industry. Yeah, yeah, his first uh, first jobs, all software development. And uh, uh would, you know, at, at that time, and I suppose to some degree still, they're, they're just, you didn't have to search for a job. There were just opportunities available. So yeah. I jumped from company to company. And eventually I was part of a company that had recently been bought out by someone. And then they got bought out by someone and <laughs> they, uh, they fired a bunch of people 
that were part of the other company. And so I got promoted into management for, I would say, all the wrong reasons. Like, you, ever, you know, you, sometimes you see someone who's very good, uh, let's say, answering phones at a call center. Yeah. Let's make them a manager of call center people and they destroy their teams. That was kind of me. Yeah, like I, I didn't have any training to, to be a, a leader of teams or anything like that. So I was... I would say I was promoted for all the wrong reasons, but it's also why I learned a lot of stuff by making lots of mistakes. Yeah. Well, and I wonder, and, and again, you'll correct me on when this was, but the management training around then, I imagine it was limited, wasn't it? It was yeah. not as it was based on a few experts out there, a few books out there, not necessarily a lot of tried and tested Um uh, scientific experience and on some, if you, if you want to call it what it is in industrial age type thinking. I think so. Yeah. 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 So it, it, yeah. It, again, even so, and as you say, you like, you see some of this industrial age thinking in call centers now and, and in, in some of the big warehousing organizations. Yeah. Right. Um, but, and I think that's a thing that I noticed over the years as I've gone through is that the quality of, or, what makes sense to me in the management training is, is so improved over the years about understanding the individual, not trying to corral the individual into a box. Mm, right. Yeah. I, seems... I feel like, uh, I feel like I, whether I was trained at Nigel or I just assumed it, but it was all about being the boss, you mm. know, like the idea of servant leadership was, was not yeah. something that yeah. got talked about. The idea of fostering psychological safety was not something that was being talked about. It was about a uh, uh, supervisor subordinate, which really, when you yeah. think about it, subordinate, yeah. what a terrible term, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so I, I, had, I, had to learn, I had to learn the hard way, but it was a technical group. And so it helped because I could at least relate to them to that degree. And we had you know, some relationships. In fact, I would say my early teams, Nigel, were really strong. So I thought I was pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they did well despite you. Right, yeah. Until I got some teams where they weren't as strong. And then it was like, oh, okay. Maybe I'm not that awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I think you do, learn. I remember some of my first roles in, in project management. I remember running up to a bunch of people. There was a problem with something. It's kind of like, right, where's this admin? Why can't they just sort it out? And the person looking at me going, I'm sysadmin and I'm working on it. And I'm like, I this small i was tiny <laughs> i was just felt like an idiot and i learned something that day <laughs> and i can remember there's very few conversations i remember from the company i was in that yeah. i was on right there i remember that one vividly i can even see the room i can see the cupboards on the wall i can see <laughs> you know, it's because um how how i felt and thought yeah how i one of the big like say so your big lessons when you do it wrong isn't it sort of thing mm. so you know, so there's this guy who's a former head of training at Facebook and it, it's probably been a couple of years since I interviewed him, but he had a book on culture, but I'll tell you, Nigel, this, this idea was helpful. And it's, I think it's related to what you said. He, and this is, if this is not a direct quote, it's really close. He said something along the lines of every company sucks. Your job is not to make it not suck. It's to make it suck less. <laughs> and, and part of the reason why it sucks is you're part of it and you suck. <laughs> right? So I almost didn't interview him because that was like the depth of the book, but, but isn't there some truth to it? Like yeah. sometimes we think, we think, Oh, my company is so messed up or, or whatever, or, but Hey, I'm part of it. So what am I going to do? And, and, and I could blame people. I could blame my team. I could blame the company. I could blame the culture, but what am I doing to make it better? Yeah. And, and make sure I'm not making it worse. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, it's like when you're sat in a queue of traffic complaining about the traffic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're part of it. <laughs> You're part of it, right? Exactly. Good. What am I doing? Yeah. Am yeah. I driving in a way that's going to help? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, I hope you enjoyed that first part of the interview with Andy Kaufman. Um, I will be speaking to him again next week and we'll find out more. So uh, looking forward to speaking to you then. Cheers now. Have a great week. Bye. Wow, you made it this far. I'm guessing that you enjoyed the show if you have. Or maybe you've just left it playing in the background and forgot it was on. But if you did enjoy it and uh, you're inclined to, 
I'd be delighted if you could share your, the show with your colleagues. Uh, it's discoverability with podcasts is quite difficult, especially with a niche one like this. But sharing with your colleagues and letting them have a chance to listen to these fantastic guests would be brilliant. If you've got time, a review on whatever platform you uh, listen to it on uh, would be great too, especially if it was a five star one. Again, that makes it easier for people to discover the show when they're searching on there because comments uh, raise it up the old search engine op- optimization on all the different tools. If you are feeling flush, I have a couple of ways you could uh, contribute. One is Patreon, uh, Patreon slash Sunday Lunch PM, and you can. Donate some money to the to the podcast that way, uh, or you can jump along to my my um, website nigelcreaser.com www.nigelcreaser.com and click on the link to the shop. And in there, you've got all my books that I've created uh, in the varying different guises, a number of different ways you can grab a copy of those. And down the bottom, I've got the uh, well, my guests' books. So everyone who's been on here, if they've had a book, I've got a link to their their uh, their book in there and Amazon give me a little bit back for when someone buys from them but uh, more importantly uh, if you come back next time and listen um, I'll be delighted so I'll leave you alone and let you get on with your day now thank you bye well it's goodbye from me Nigel Creaser and it's goodbye from him the Sunday lunch p.m goodbye <laughs>